I was born and brought up in a third world country, the USA. Now what do I mean by that? Let's explore it. Here's your story, let's begin. The water's fine, come on, dive in. The future's here, it's right before your eyes. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank you. Um, the last video, I received a lot of feedback, a lot of positives, a lot of likes, picked up quite a few subscribers. It was very gratifying, and I need to take a moment to thank you. So what do I mean by third world country? I hear quite a bit and read quite a bit people making comments about Ecuador is a third world country. And I'm going to explain why it's not only condescending, insulting, but it's also inaccurate. I grew up in the United States. I spent my early years in a place called the Thousand Islands, which is right on the border, literally on the border of Canada and New York. And I grew up on an island. A few years later, from ages from maybe 6 to 12, 13, something like that, I grew up in the country in a place called Bristol in New York State, upstate New York. I grew up pulling water out of a well, cutting firewood for heat in the winter, having an outhouse outside in the winter, you trudge through the snow and ice, 20 below, freezing your tail off at 2 o'clock in the morning because you need to use the toilet. That's about as third world as you can get, right? First you want to take a look at the source, so, but we're not really going to go by that, but just for the sake of understanding, the, the concept of different standards and types of living really began in France in the mid-1700s, I believe. I probably should have Googled this before I started, but uh, they broke their country down into three types of places that you could live. Uh, of course, Paris being the, the pinnacle. But the modern day term came really around World War II time. Uh, after the war, you had the first world, which were the Allies. You had the second, the second world, which was the communist sphere of influence, USSR, and that sort of thing. And then you had the third world, which was everybody else. And in those times, you probably just looked at the, really the manufacturing countries, the ones were at the forefront of technology and leading in um, societal changes and that sort of thing. And the couple hundred countries um, outside of that sphere just kind of chugged along in their own little third world. So how does that apply to Ecuador? Well, first of all, Ecuador is no more third world than the United States that I grew up in. Let's talk about the United States before we get to Ecuador. Where are you talking about? If you have ever been to Appalachia, if you've ever been to the um, deep woods just south of Asheville in North Carolina, and there's places all around the country. We could talk about Idaho and Montana. There's lots of places where you're fortunate if you even get electricity. You're not going to get cable. You probably don't have running water except you running to a well. You're cutting your firewood. You know, they call it off the grid. There are a lot of places and a lot of people that live off the grid or semi off the grid because that's the way they live. I've been to places in Pennsylvania that are like that. If you go up around the Adirondack Mountains in New York, you're going to find that. Most states, hell, three quarters of Maine is like that. They're wonderful areas, but you're not going to run, jump into your car and shoot down the street to Walmart or Target or Macy's or whatever it is and grab some. It, it's not that kind of living. It's the kind of living that you put on the insulated boots and you grab your gun and you go out and find yourself some dinner. Is that third world? I don't know. I don't know if those things even apply anymore. If you go to New York City, it's one of the finest cities in the world. On the other hand, if you go to Hong Kong, it's even finer. So 
this competition for who's better really is a bit condescending. When you come to, if you go to a city like Guayaquil, that is a world-class city. It's as modern and has as many facilities as any place you're going to go. Quito takes a blend of the old world with the new world, and it's the same thing. Whatever you want, you've got it. Cuenca has pretty much come up to those standards. There's a lot of old world that still exists in Cuenca, particularly in the heart of Cuenca. But around it, you've got over half a million people living in the equivalent of the suburbs. They're driving cars. You know, they've got fiber optic internet. There are some things that are actually more advanced depending on where you come from. Now, if you take a drive outside of Cuenca or outside of Quito and you go to a country area, a campesino, a farm, those kinds of things, then you're going to find things more rustic. You're going to find chickens running like here. You hear the chickens sometimes because that's how they're living there. They're, it's a bit of a throwback in time. Does that make you better if you come from the US or Canada or China or from somewhere in Europe, England, Spain? You come here, is it, oh, those cute little people, they just need some modernization? It's, it, no. Whatever you think you know about being modern and technology, you're probably going to find it here. I will say technology is stifled simply because of governmental policies and taxes and that kind of thing. There's no cheap technology. Technology is expensive. But they've got it. You see people all over the place with iPhones and with, with nice cameras. The only difference is instead of paying like $800 for a camera like this one, they're going to pay $2,000 for that same camera. So it, it hurts them in that way, but they're aware of the technology. They just have to work harder and longer to be able to afford it. So I think it's important that you remember, if you're considering moving here, which is why I do these videos for those people, or you've just been here recently, you really shouldn't judge it with your preconceived notions. Oh, I'm going to South America, I'm going to a third world country. It's a big mistake to do that. There are some things that are advanced, there's some things that are retarded, but overall, it's, on average, it's, it's pretty up there. So at, at the most, you could say maybe a developing country, because there's a lot of infrastructure that they're working on, they're still developing but there's keen awareness. The educational system is as fine as anywhere. Um, there, if you meet 10 people, you'll probably find seven people that are college educated. So uh, be careful of those judgments and the frame of mind you put yourself in when you come here. Because if it were me, I would feel pretty insulted when people are talking about third world because the implication is you just don't know and you just don't have what you should have and, and nothing could be further from the truth. That's not to say that there aren't issues. If building trades, for example, uh, you can get a house built and it could be really shoddy because they don't have the permitting it to the same standard as a lot of places, but on the other, the other side of that coin is there's a certain amount of freedom where you don't have to take six months with some town board to get permission to build a little shack out back to put chickens in. So for every plus there's a minus and for every minus there's a plus. Ecuador is not a third world country by original definitions or even by today's standards. Ecuador is a thriving, modern, populated economic machine. So um, 
rethink how you're going to uh, put the picture of Ecuador into your mind. Uh, one of the worst sins of all when you travel is condescension. Don't fall for that. So look at there. It's still raining. I don't know, can you see it? It's still raining. Imagine that. Again, I want to thank you and uh, stay tuned for uh, my next video. The next one's coming up. I've got one on why Ecuador, why not Colombia, for example? And how did I make that choice since I lived in Colombia and I talk about Colombia? And so that'll be interesting, at least for me. And then one after that is I get a, quite a few times, what is a facilitator? Why would you have it? Is it worth the money and that sort of thing? And so uh, later this week, I'm going to introduce you to the person who uh, was introduced to me by friends who helped me with a lot of things, became a very good friend. I've known her now for over a year. And in some cases, I would actually hire her to do some specific tasks. And it was some of the best money I ever spent. It's made my life here so much better. You know you could.